Just like any profession, sound engineers have a set of tools to get the job done. Those tools are our equalizers, compressors, reverb and delay units, gates, expanders, and the many other processors that you may find in a modern digital audio workstation. But knowing what tools you have in your arsenal is not even half the battle. Knowing how to use these tools and understanding everything that they are capable of is what helps to make a versatile and efficient engineer. So in this series, I aim to provide in-depth tutorials on the functions and techniques of these processors to help you create more professional and interesting mixes. In this episode, we're going to take a look at three ways to apply compression, how to do it yourself, and why you might want to use these particular methods anyways. These applications go beyond simply just slapping a compressor plugin onto an insert and definitely have some interesting and versatile results. The techniques we will look at in this video are serial compression, parallel compression, and sidechain compression. The picture here is a little hard to follow, but I tried my best to give you a general idea of the signal flow of these processes. The first method that I want to share with you today is called serial compression, also known as incremental compression. Serial compression is the practice of applying multiple compression units onto one source, one right after the other. What this allows you to do is make many small and detailed dynamic adjustments to the source as to progressively apply the dynamic processing. Serial compression allows you to spread the workload. So instead of using one compressor for all the dynamic processing on a track, you can spread it out over multiple units and further sculpt how the processing interacts with that element. Here's a basic example. Vocals tend to be very dynamic, right? As in, they can be very soft and quiet at one point and then be breaking into the red in the next. Usually, you want to control these dynamics so that there are not too many jumps in level. Obviously, this is why you use a compressor, but in some more extreme circumstances, you may need to use higher ratios, such as 4 to 1, 6 to 1, even like 8 to 1, to get the dynamic leveling that is desired. The issue with having such high ratios is that the compressor begins to become less transparent, and it becomes obvious that there is some type of dynamic processing on the vocals. This can significantly interfere with the clarity and smoothness of the vocal. This is where serial compression comes into play. Instead of using just one compressor with a 6 to 1 ratio, you can spread that over two compressors with a 3 to 1 ratio. Not only does this present a more transparent compression, it also allows you to modify each compressor stage in a way to fit your scenario more appropriately. What I mean by modify each compressor is instead of only having one set of attack and release controls, you now theoretically have two. You could use one of these 3 to 1 compression stages to tackle the transient of the sound and the other to tackle the sustain, spreading out the compression over the entire sound element. On top of this, you can also take advantage of different types of compressors if you're not using your standard compressor plugins that have attack and release. For example, you could use a tube compressor, which tends to be a bit slower for the overall dynamic leveling, and then use something like a distressor to react quickly and clamp down on a very specific portion of the sound. Overall, serial compression is a great way to add your dynamic processing and stages. It generally gives you a more transparent effect when heavy compression is needed, and it also gives you more control and definition as to how the processor will compress the sound. There is more control and overall more versatility with this method of compression. Parallel compression is the next technique I want to talk about, and to be honest, I definitely misunderstood the main purpose of this type of compression for a while. The main reason you want to use parallel compression is to achieve the effect of upwards compression. What I mean by this is simply bring up the most quiet parts of a signal while leaving the transients intact. The issue with doing this normally is that there are very few compressors that actually do this on their own, where they compress the signal if it does not pass a specific threshold versus compressing when it does pass a threshold. Not only are there fewer options for this type of processor, but by doing this you are also actively raising the noise floor. I've personally experienced this raising of the noise floor a lot, with even just normal compression. Have you ever added an aggressive compressor to something like a solo acoustic guitar? You'll notice how the breathing of the musician all of a sudden starts to become more audible. Well, imagine this is what would happen with these upward compressors, except now they wouldn't even compress the transients, so they just are rarely practical. This is where parallel compression really shines. The way parallel compression works is by sending the original signal into two paths, one of which goes through its own original channel and the other gets sent through a separate channel that has a compressor on it. This is where the name parallel compression gets its name. It's because the compression track runs parallel to the original signal. 
On the compression channel, the ratio parameter needs to be set rather aggressively, even to the point where it becomes a limiter. Along with that, the threshold needs to be set rather low so that the signal gets limited quite often. For this particular method, it is important to keep the transients of the original signal unprocessed or only slightly compressed. This is because you are already significantly limiting the transients and louder parts of the signal on the compression track. The goal is to only bring up the softest parts of the signal, so by not compressing the original track's dynamics, we allow the loudest parts of the signal to still come through as they are. However, what happens then is when the signal is below the threshold on the compression track, it will combine with the original track. And when two of the same signals are combined, there is a plus 6 dB boost in level, so that the combined signal below the threshold will now be 6 dB louder. And the signal on the compression track will not pass the dynamic threshold due to the limiter, as to not affect the overall signal level above the set threshold. What is really cool to note as well is that if you need even more level, you can simply add just another channel of parallel compression to achieve another 6 dB boost to the lowest signal levels. So I hope you can understand through these illustrations why this doesn't affect the noise floor in the same way as simply adding a compressor. When you use normal upwards compression, the relationship between the noise floor and the lowest signal level is diminished, therefore making the noise floor more audible. When you simply add 6 dB of level to both of them, the noise floor still increases in level, but doesn't reduce the level relationship between it and the signal. The end effect really helps to make certain aspects of your mix sound bigger, and now hopefully you understand why. But let me give you a few common examples of where this process tends to shine. The most common place that I see it in use is on a kick or a snare. Have you ever recorded a drum and realized the drummer had trouble playing at a consistent dynamic level? and the kick or snare sometimes tends to have a few wimpy hits? Add a layer or two of parallel compression to it, and you'll find that the hits become significantly more consistent, and then all you have to do to make them stick out in the mix is find their spot in the frequency spectrum with EQ. Another great place to use parallel compression is to send the entire drum kit along with the bass guitar to the compression channel. Not only will it bring up the entire rhythm section so that it remains consistent and prominent, it also adds an element of togetherness. One more little tip if you're feeling experimental is to add an EQ after your parallel compression channel and add two shelves boosting the extreme low and high end to really bring out a thicker and more brilliant rhythm section. All right, so the last compression technique that I wanna talk about in this video is side chain compression. Just like parallel compression, this technique involves two different channels. We're gonna call these channels the compression channel and the side chain channel. Now you should understand that compression works by monitoring a signal level. And when that signal level passes a certain point, it begins to compress the signal according to the parameters set. Now the way sidechain compression works is instead of the compression channel monitoring its own signal, it will monitor the sidechain channel signal. And when that passes a certain threshold, then the compressor will clamp down on the compression channel signal. Applying sidechain compression is very easy. Almost all compressor plugins have some sort of sidechain input, usually known as the key input. All you need to do is turn it on and select the channel you want to trigger the compression. Now, there are a lot of unique uses for this type of compression. Some are practical and some are creative. I'm not going to cover all of the things you can do with this, but I will give you an example of each. One of the first common practical uses for the sidechain method was in radio. There would be a compressor on the music track and their voice would be sidechained to that compressor. The result was that when they would talk into the microphone, their voice would trigger the compressor on the music track which would then be compressed under the sound of their voice. This way, they would not have to turn down the music every time they wanted to say something. The parameters set for sidechain compression can vary greatly depending on how aggressive you want the sidechain effect to be. Obviously, with a higher ratio, the compression will be more drastic. For the instance of the radio DJ, usually you want the parameters to be set rather high so that the music gets compressed quite a bit and the vocals shine through. But if you are using the more musical application, you'll find that a more mild compression setting might work better. Sidechain compression is a very popular and commonly used technique in any electronically produced music. One of the reasons for this is that music like hip hop and electronic dance music rely heavily on a strong kick to hold the rhythm of the song. It's what makes you want to dance and bob your head to the beat. Sidechain compression can really help you accentuate the beat even further. 
It is not rare to add a light or even heavy set compressor to every single track and side the chain the kick so that everything ducks a bit out of the way for when the kick comes through. This is why you probably would not want to duck everything too much, but just enough so that the kick comes through nice and strong every time it hits. So these are the three compression techniques beyond the standard that I find most useful and commonly applicable. I hope you can understand how to apply each of these techniques now and for what situations you might use them for. Using these techniques not only can help you treat the dynamics of your song, but it can also add new texture that you can further detail with other processors. Compression is definitely hard to grasp and even harder to apply correctly, so I hoped I helped you down the road of doing so a bit more with this video. I'm going to wrap it up here and start working on my next advanced processor tutorial for you guys. I hope everyone is having a good day and I will see you in the next video.